Today we are going to continue small steps on chapter two and we were left on kind of a cliffhanger because in chapter one it ends with this single sentence that says, when I woke up, I was paralyzed. So let's see what continues to happen in chapter two. And this chapter is called paralyzed from the neck down, meaning from the neck down, she's unable to move. My mouth felt full of sawdust, my lips stuck together in the corners, as I opened my eyes, I saw a glass of water on the table by my bed. It was exactly what I needed, but when I tried to reach the water, my right arm didn't move. I tried again. Nothing happened. I tried with my left arm. Nothing. I tried to bend my knees so I can roll on my side, but my legs were two logs, stiff and unmoving. I was too weak to even lift my head off the pillow. Help! A nurse ran in. I can't reach the water, I said. There's something wrong with my hands. I'm thirsty, but when I try to get to the glass, hush, she said. She lifted the glass and slipped a straw between my lips. There you are, have your drink. I took only a sip. What's wrong with my arms and legs? I asked. Why can't I move? You have polio, she said, as if that explained everything. But I could move before I fell asleep. I walked in here. I had polio then and I could still move. Don't try to talk, just save your energy. She held the straw to my lips again and I drank the glass of water. I'll be right back, she said when I finished. She returned quickly with the doctor. While he examined me, the nurse held up a clipboard and made notes. Move your right hand, the doctor said. I tried, but my hand wouldn't move. Try to wiggle your fingers. My fingers lay like an empty glove. He put his hand around my wrist and lifted my arm, a foot off the bed. Hold your arm in the air when I let go, he said. I could feel his hand on my wrist, but when he let go, my arm flopped down. I felt like a raggedy Ann doll I left on my bed at home. He pulled back the sheet. I wore a short hospital gown rather than my old pajamas. I don't remember putting it on, and I wonder who had undressed me. Try to lift your leg. I closed my eyes and concentrated, but my leg remained on the bed. Okay, now try to lift your other leg. My right leg stayed exactly where it was. Can you wiggle your toes? I could not. Each time the doctor asked me to move a part of my body and I couldn't move it, my terror increased. I could talk, I could open and close my eyes, I could turn my head from side to side on my pillow, but otherwise I couldn't move at all. The doctor ran a wooden tongue depressor up the bottom of my feet. I wanted to kick it away, but my feet wouldn't budge. He placed his hands on my rib. Intercoastal expansion is poor, he said. I felt as if I needed a translator. What does that mean? I asked. The muscles which expand the rib cage when you breathe are weak, the nurse explained. The doctor said, diagnosis is acute anterior polyomyelitis. The patient is paralyzed from the neck down. I did not need a translator for that last sentence. The doctor left saying he would return in an hour to check on me. We'll keep you comfortable, the nurse said and I'll tell your parents about the paralysis. Are they here? I asked. I wanna see them. I'm sorry, she said. You're in isolation, so no visitors are allowed. She started for the door, turned and added, we can't risk spreading the disease. She left me alone with my terror. Don't think about being paralyzed, I told myself. But how could I think of anything else? The nurse had forgotten to pull the sheet back up and the skimpy hospital gown didn't even reach my knees. I wanted to cover myself, but I couldn't. Feeling vulnerable and exposed, I grew more panicky. What if the hospital caught fire? How would I get out? The doctor's words played over and over in my head like a broken record. The patient is paralyzed from the neck down. The patient is paralyzed from the neck down. I wanted mother and dad, and I wanted to be well again. I wanted to go home. When the doctor returned an hour later, I felt short of breath. The patient's nostrils are flaring, he said to the nurse. I wonder if he was describing me or a horse. For two days, the fever stayed at 102, and it became increasingly difficult to breathe. Mostly I slept, waking often because of muscle spasms or because my back and neck ached so badly. A nurse gently massaged my shoulders, back and legs, which helped temporarily. I was given an aspirin for the pain. My voice developed a nasal twang. It sounded like a bad tape recording of myself. The nurses told me that my parents sent their love. They were waiting nearby and wanted to see me, but it was against the hospital's rules. I thought the rules were foolish. 
Mother and dad had already been exposed to me at home and in the car when they drove me to the hospital, so why can't they visit me now? Doctors and nurses checked me frequently and urged me to drink something. I drank water, but it became harder and harder to swallow. I wanted only to be left alone so I could sleep. When I slept, it didn't hurt. On my third day at the sheltering arms, the doctor said, be patient, the patient may need a respirator. University hospital, the nurse said. The doctor nodded. I'll arrange for an ambulance, the nurse said. That conversation got my attention and I roused myself enough to ask, what's happening? The doctor put his hand on my shoulder. There's more than one kind of polio, he said. One is spinal polio and it's the most common type and it causes paralysis in the patient's arms and legs. That means that the patient can't move their arm or legs. That's the one I have, I asked. Is that why I can't move? Yes, you have spinal polio. Another kind of polio is respiratory, which causes difficulty breathing. I was acutely aware of how hard it was for me to breathe. Was he telling me that I had two kinds of polio? Because you have respiratory polio too, he said. We're transferring you to the University of Minnesota Hospital. We're afraid your lungs may not continue to function on their own. What was he saying? If my lungs quit working, I would stop breathing, and if I stopped breathing, I would die. Is that what the doctor meant? That I was going to die? I really wanted my parents. The doctor continued. The Sheltering Arms is a rehabilitation center for polio patients who are trying to regain the use of their muscles. So it's not equipped to deal with cases as critical as yours. University Hospital has respirators, and I want you to be on one to help you breathe. If your lungs can't function on their own, the respirator is going to help. It'll breathe for you. I didn't know what a respirator was, but if it would help me breathe, it must be okay. At least it seemed I was not going to die right on the spot. You'll be taken by the ambulance to the University Hospital, he continued. I hope you'll be back at the sheltering arms soon. I said nothing. I had not wanted to come to the sheltering arms in the first place. Why would I be in any hurry to return? This move was bad news. It meant I was so sick that I needed a hospital with more emergency facilities than the sheltering arms had. I could not sit up. I could not move my arms or legs. It was hard to breathe and I was burning with fever and I was far more frightened than I'd ever been in my entire life. I not only had polio, I had two kinds of polio. I'll call your parents, the doctor said, softly patting my arm. They can meet you at the university hospital. I was transferred from the bed to the gurney and wheeled out a door where the ambulance waited. The cool outdoor air brought me out of my feverish stupor. I was surprised to see that it was dark out. I had lost track of time. This is backward, I thought. I walked into the hospital by myself, and now three days later, I can't move at all. Hospitals are supposed to make you get better, not worse. While the attendants opened the ambulance doors and prepared to load me in, I heard a buzzing sound. A mosquito was flying around my head. Zzz, zzz. I turned my face from side to side, hoping to discourage it from landing on me, but the buzzing grew louder and then abruptly stopped. I couldn't swat the mosquito or brush it away, and it bit me on the cheek. As we drove through the streets of Minneapolis, people in cars looked curiously in the ambulance window. I longed to pull the blanket up over my head, but I could not move my hands, so instead I shut my eyes and pretended I was dead. It seemed like a fine joke to those who stared, and gave me great satisfaction. With my eyes shut, pretending to be dead, I fell asleep. When I woke up, I was in a different hospital bed. Where are my parents? I asked my nurse. You're in the isolation ward. No visitors allowed. But the doctor at Sheltering Arms called them. He said that they could meet me here. She glanced at my chart. They were here when you were admitted, she said. They signed the papers. Well, why didn't someone wake me up? Angry tears filled my eyes. I had slept through the chance to see my parents. No one except the doctors and nurses could come into my room. They wore masks, gowns, and gloves that were sterilized or destroyed after they cared for me. The next day, I had another spinal tap. That afternoon, a new doctor stood beside my bed. There's more than one kind of polio, he said. I opened my mouth to interrupt him and tell him I already knew all about it, but before I could say anything, he said, the least common kind is called bulbar polio. Bulbar? That's a new word. I braced myself for more bad news. Bulbar is the most serious form of polio, he continued. Worse than spinal or respiratory? I didn't see how that was possible. 
What could be worse than being paralyzed from the neck down and unable to breathe properly? Bulbar polio impairs the patient's ability to talk or to swallow. I whispered my question. Do I have bulbar polio? I knew the answer. Why else would he be explaining this? But I just had to ask. His answer was a simple and direct, yes. I could think of nothing to say. I had three kinds of polio. There's a call button next to your hand, he said, indicating the cord with a button at the end that lay on my bed. Then he glanced at my chart. You can't use it, can you? I tried to push the button, just in case I had a miraculous cure in the last five minutes, but my fingers remain where they were. No. If you can't swallow and start to choke, yell for a nurse. There's always someone nearby. His words, intended to reassure me, filled me with panic. If I was choking, how would I be able to call for a nurse? That's the end of chapter two, and there's been a huge development. She went from having a fever to being completely paralyzed from the neck down and hearing that she might not be able to swallow or talk soon. Yikes, okay, tell me, what happened in the book? What sorts of thoughts are you having in your head? And what kind of feelings do you have in your heart about this?